Okay, I'm going to kick us off because nobody wants to hear my introduction anyway. So we'll let people come in from the waiting room. So thank you everybody for joining our webinar today. The first of two webinars that we will be doing this spring to help you all set your foundation in the future of law, of your future in the law. My name is Heather Nielsen and I'll be your moderator today behind the scenes and I work on the marketing team here at Major Lindsay in Africa. I am excited to be hosting this session today with my two colleagues, Rubot and Stephanie Bitterin, two of my colleagues actually in our New York office that um, I get to see on a semi-regular basis or virtually like this. But before we get started, I'd like to go over some brief housekeeping items. You should all be able to see the screen right now and hopefully hear my voice. All attendees are in listen-only mode for the duration of this presentation. The call is being recorded and we will also send this out to you after the call should you need to jump off early. We expect this to be about an hour, including Q&A. You may ask us a question at any time throughout this call and we encourage you to do so. At the top right of your screen is the GoToWebinar panel. Just open up the console, type a question, and hit submit. I will save the Q&A to the end, um, so feel free to submit the questions at any time, but just to know your questions will be anonymous and your name will not be shared with the rest of the audience. Just your question. Um, at the close of today's webinar, a survey will pop up on your screen. We hope that you'll take the time to fill it out. It's short, about uh, one to two minutes tops. It'll let us know how Rue and Steph did, as well as any other topics you'd like to hear from us as well as content you'd like to see for the Law School Toolkit. Now, before I turn this over to my colleagues, I'd like to briefly give you an agenda of what we plan to cover today. Um, so we're gonna start off with some introductions so you know who you're hearing from. We're gonna talk about who we are, a general framework. We're gonna give you an introduction to big law. And also we'll go over those oh so important 10 questions you should be asking yourself. And lastly, we'll discuss Q&A. Um, also, um, we probably will get a lot of Q&A questions so I'm going to try to pull the ones that are most um, related to this audience. If you are an international student, um, don't despair if I skip over your question. We have an international version of this presentation that I can send to you after the webinar. So I'm gonna turn this over to Stephanie and Rue for some brief introductions and we'll dive right in. Great, thank you so much, Heather. I don't think I realized this was like a life-size picture of me here. So, um, <laughs> well, we're thrilled to be here and appreciate our partnership with Barbary to be able to speak with all of you uh, future attorneys. My name is Stephanie Bitterman. I am a partner in the New York office of Major Lindsay, where I focus primarily on placing associates and I was a real estate associate at Paul Hastings prior to my career in recruiting and uh, excited to have the opportunity to speak with you all today, Rue. Thanks, Stephanie. I really like that picture, by the way, so. <laughs> <Love it. laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Rue Bott. I'm a partner at Major Lindsay as well. Um, I've been here since about 2008. I primarily work with minority and diverse attorneys, but of course I'm happy to work um, with anyone. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't wish everyone a happy International Women's Day. Um, I will say that all of my success can be attributed to the phenomenal women in my life, including my work wife, Stephanie Bitterman. So thank you for all that you do. Um, and today is also holy. As a Hindu American, happy holy for anyone that is celebrating today. So I just wanted to do that as well. Um, as you can see, I do both partner and associate placements, and um, I think I already mentioned I've been at MLA since 2008, so that's almost 15 years, which is wild. But I do remember when I was in those oh, okay. days, too. <laughs> <laughs> Season. Uh, right. So, who is MLA, right? Um, we are the world's largest and the nation's top ranked legal search firm. What we primarily do is we work with experienced attorneys and help them with lateral moves, help them move in-house, um, whether it's at the, on the law firm side, it's on the associate level, the partner level. We also work a lot in law firm management. So we are experts in almost all sorts of legal hiring. In fact, all sorts of legal hiring, I think. Um, and that's why we're really well situated to give you a sense of what uh, law firm clients are typically looking for um, and give you insight on how the sort of law student process works as well because you're typically going to apply be applying to these big law firms so what we're going to do today is we're going to ask you to engage in some self-assessment you might be wondering 10 questions to choose a practice area why do we have to think about this now we'll get into that in a minute but first you really need to think about yourself right 
self-assessment is going to be an ongoing process. Um, your values, skills, and interests may change over, over time, but your personality is not going to. So what we're going to do is going to take some time for you to think about what makes you tick? What is it that you like? And, you know, all of these factors that get you going, because they're going to make a big impact um, in your career. And they're also going to affect the type of practice area you're going to want to choose. We are going to talk a lot about the different types of practice areas. You're going to get a lot of names that are thrown at you. There is a handout on the control panel for you to download at the end of this presentation that will give you the nitty gritty on each type of practice area. We're going to be talking about things very high level, but don't worry, our, our brochure does give you um, an idea of the day to day and exactly what to expect, whether in each type of area as well. So definitely make sure to download that in, for, in order to um, know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and just to um, add to what Ruth said, there, there's no right and wrong answers here with respect to self-assessment. We encourage everyone to just be very honest about themselves so that you can figure out what hopefully will be a great fit. Yeah, that's exactly right, Stephanie. Like, you want to be in a position where you can make an informed career decision to see something that, to find something that fits within your values, your skills, your likes and dislikes, etc. Bottom line, if you enjoy your practice, you're going to be really happy. You're going to be engaged. You're going to like what you do. It's so often that people we talk to, they're like, oh, well, I don't know about all of these hours, et cetera. But then I'm like, well, what if you liked that, what you did? And then they're like, well, absolutely. I'm happy to put in all the hours necessary in order to do so. We are talking a lot about big law today. Hours are going to be a piece of it. So we want to make sure that you actually enjoy what it is that you're doing, OK? Basically, what we're going to be asking you to figure out is, what is your ideal job? Your ideal job is going to hit all of these points that you see on the slide here. And at the end of the day, it's going to give you a lot of career satisfaction. You have a really long career ahead of you. And the choices that you make early on, even as a law student, with the types of firms you apply to, et cetera, are going to make a huge impact on the rest of your career. So let's talk a little bit more about what that means and what big law is all about. Yeah, I think that sometimes people get overwhelmed when they hear big law, but I think the important thing for purposes of this discussion is to think about it more in terms of a framework. Big law is, generally speaking, the AMLAW top 200 firms by you know, revenue. And these firms structure their practices in sort of three different buckets, litigation, corporate, which we can kind of use interchangeably um, as transactional, as well as regulatory practices. And as we'll get into a little bit later, there are a lot of subspecialties within these buckets. But at the end of the day, um, that's the, the umbrella that we want you to be thinking about. And you also want to remember that the big law firms represent big corporate clients and support the needs of those clients. So you're not necessarily going to see every single practice or area within big law. You don't usually see family law or um, dealing with DWIs. Um, many don't have matrimonial practices. That being said, we want to just kind of explain big law supports, you know, big corporations, tech, um, you know, generally. So recognizing that this presentation has a lot to do with big law, many associates start out in big law, but we thought it was important just to provide a quick preview of some of the opportunities that could come your way, that, that could, you know, you could kind of get into later in your career. Um, but those would be other law firms, maybe it's a larger law firm, maybe it's a boutique, government roles, which could span the gamut, in-house, nonprofits, you know, business side, law school teaches you how to think. And it has a lot, there are a lot of opportunities, but our focus on this presentation for the most part is kind of that initial step, recognizing that most of you are, you know, many are one L's, maybe two L's. So we, we wanted to address kind of the elephant in the room here, which is COVID. And we recognize, you know, this can be an entirely separate presentation. So we're, you know, we're, we're going to keep it very high level. But, 
you know, given everything that has changed in the last couple of years, we felt we'd be remiss if we didn't include it. So very, very high level. How has COVID impacted the legal industry? And generally what we've seen is lawyers can be very productive at home. <laughs> um, remote working, it works. 2021 and 2022 were banner years for these firms with respect to revenue, profitability, um, and that's all terrific. However, it comes at a cost. And what we have seen, and we've heard this over and over again from partners, from law firm leaders, and also from associates, the associates that graduated in 2020, 2021, and 2022, who have been remote for most, if not all of their careers, those associates, the training and the mentorship has really suffered. And that has been challenging. So where we're at now is that most firms are offering kind of a balance and a hybrid uh, structure. So, you know, there's also kind of a separate issue of geographic, flex geographic flexibility, which is related to remote, which is um, kind of in flux at the moment. But bottom line, that's what we're seeing. So how should this impact you as a law student? I think the big message we have here is there is value to being in the office, whether that's in a hybrid uh, capacity or a full-time capacity with respect to training and mentorship, because the legal industry is an apprenticeship model. You will learn a lot being able to just pop into a partner's office and shadow on a deal in a way that you just can't do on Zoom. There's a lot of benefits, of course, as we sit here today, but um, there is no substitute for that. So. Um, that is what, you know, it should not be the only consideration and we're, hope, we're hoping that you use this presentation to really think about kind of the big picture practice area you want to be in, but we did want to highlight the importance of that because we're really seeing that impact things now. So getting back to kind of the more relevant piece of our presentation, why does this matter? You're in law school, you're, you know, you could be a 1L, 2L, 3L. You know, why are we talking to you about what practice area you should choose? The main reason is, and if you take anything from today, please have this be it. Switching practice areas is very, very hard. We are not here to say it never happens. It can. There are times when it has. Rue and I have worked with candidates where we have. But mm -hmm. the most challenging calls that we get from associates are, you know, I'm I'm a litigator, I hate it, I'm dying to be a corporate lawyer, how do I do that? And that's really hard because associates get branded really early. And the reason for this is more about the business of law than the practice of law. And it's about law firm economics. At the big law firms, you start with a starting salary that, and you will be billed to clients as a first year. As you get more senior, a second year has a matching billing rate as a second year. And if you are, for example, a litigator operating at a third year, you have your third year salary, you have your third year billing rate. If you then switch to corporate, the law firm has lost their investment in you because you have to go back to billing as a first year. That's the very oversimplified reason that changing practice areas is hard. And that is why we encourage you to be very thoughtful about mm -hmm. um, about making the decision from an early stage and planning and being proactive. Yeah, and even if you try to make that move, you can say, hey, I'm happy to move it. I'm happy to start as a first year over again. Firms are just not willing to do that, even on a lateral standpoint. The number of times that people say, oh, can't you just find me um, a first year position? Unfortunately, uh, for, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, firms are just not really willing to do that. They look at their summer associate classes to fill their first year classes because they want to try folks out. They want to see if people do have the aptitude during that summer associate time to uh, become a corporate associate or become a litigation associate. But that third year litigator, it's going to be really hard for them to find an entry level corporate position once they've, they're kind of already gotten on the train. So that's why, again, exactly what Stephanie said. If there's anything you take home today, remember that switching practice areas really doesn't matter, uh, is really hard to, to manage. Uh, 
And the one um, other thing I should add here before we move on is depending on the law firm you, you go to, some firms allow their summer associates to try um, assignments in many different practice areas. Um, I know it was a long time ago, but when I was a summer, that's what I did um, based on the advice actually of a law school professor of mine. And it was great advice because I could at least feel like I had a taste of that. When you're a first year associate, again, depending on how your firm structures, you probably won't have an opportunity to do that. So if you're fortunate enough to have the opportunity to summer at a firm, um, that is just something to think about so you could try to make the most informed decision. Thanks, Steph. So let's get to the meat of the presentation. Um, big ten, questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, 10 questions you should ask yourself before choosing a practice area. Here's all 10 questions here. You can read them. We're going to just go through them one by one, but we wanted you to just at least see the roadmap of where we're going to go. So let's start with the first question. What topics are you attracted to? If you want to say this a different way, who do you want to help and how do you want to help them? Now, we've divided this into four different types of categories, people, ideas, things, and money and business. If you're attracted to people, the topic of people, now this doesn't mean are you a social person or not, but it's really more who are your clients? What are the clients that are you are going to be working with? Some practice areas are going to offer you a little bit more personal connectivity than others, right? Because you're going to be interacting with individuals. You'll see that in the employment, entertainment, family law, trust and estates, white collar crime space. I mean, it makes sense, right? In family law, it gets really personal when it comes to divorces and, you know, trust and wills, et cetera. Um, in white collar crime, you're helping someone making defending them to make sure they don't go to jail so that's pretty personal as well but by contrast you know you could be working in the corporate transactional space where you are still sort of interacting with people but you're representing the company and you and its business interest so it's not just one one person so again if you're attracted to people you're probably going to want to aim for the the practice areas that are listed in the category on our slide next up is ideas now, law school obviously teaches you to think about legal arguments and how to interpret the law. If you really love this intellectual engagement and, and the challenges that are provided with that, obviously all of these are intellectually engaging, but if that's really what, what gets you going, you might be interested in the practice areas listed here, appellate, antitrust, ERISA, IP lit, litigation, and tax. Um, this is pretty easy. You're going to be spending a lot of time writing. <laughs> You're going to be spending a lot of time um, really thinking about crafting your arguments. This is probably the closest to what you will see in law school. Um, and so if you really like the academic exercise and, and also if you want to go back into academia, these are the practice areas that you want to look at um, uh, after, pra after practicing law for a little bit. Next up is things. So when we say things, we mean just a tangible product or thing that you can touch right so again this really is looking at the subject matter the satisfaction level some people don't are not really interested in finance and just helping companies make more money but instead want to have an actual product or thing that they're thinking about so you'll see this in product liability you'll see this in finance that's connected to some sort of asset project finance real estate um renewable energy etc just to add go ahead yeah um, I, as I said, I was a former real estate lawyer, and so many of my colleagues at the time got so excited walking down the street, like, I did the development for this building, I did the lease here, I did the financing, and they would be so excited. And I kind of wasn't that excited about that. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And, you know, in hindsight, now I can see, oh, I probably didn't choose the right practice area for myself. Obviously, it ended up all working out okay for me, but um, that's kind of, if you're someone who has that excitement over being able to wrap your head around something, this is these are some really good um, practices to think about, or vice versa. Thanks, Steph. Um, and then finally, we're on the last category, which is money and business. Um, what's interesting here is you will once again, you're, who do you want to help and how? We talked a little bit about helping corporations succeed, um, making sure that their profits are growing, et cetera. Are you someone who likes to read the Wall Street Journal often? Is that something that, that you get excited about? Um, are you interested in big business in terms of, you know, are you, if a startup is getting 
another round of financing or whatever it may be. These are all areas that you're going to be more attracted to. What's really interesting is if you look at big law as a whole, this is where you'll find the most attorneys. Because again, as Stephanie said, in big law specifically, you are typically working on behalf of the big ticket companies or big ticket individuals that work at those companies. So <laughs> it's just something to keep in mind as you're trying to figure out what path makes the most sense for you and what also might be the easiest path for you to get into big law. So the next question is, um, how do you envision your role as an attorney? And you want to think about this kind of in two ways. There are leaders and there are team members. And, you know, there, there's no judgment on this either way. It's just really thinking about who controls the work. So it's actually best illustrated, I think, by example. There are practice areas where the lawyers are really the ones kind of running the show. The client cannot do what they're looking to do without the lawyer. And the easiest example of this is litigation. The client is relying on the lawyers for the strategy, for the implementation. They can't do it without the lawyers. And many litigators that we talk to really thrive in that leadership type of role. However, it's not for everyone and that's okay. And there are a lot of practice areas that we would call team members that work very collaboratively. Um, but at the end of the day, they are not the ones kind of running the show, as we say. So corporate, all of the different um, subcategories in corporate are probably the best way to think about this. When you're doing a corporate deal, you have your M&A people, you have your tax person, you have your finance partner, your executive comp, Lots of different lawyers are working together, but at the end of the day, the, the people kind of running the show tend to be the business side along with the in-house lawyers. So just think about whether this is something that's going to impact you in terms of your day-to-day -day happiness with the role. All right. Um, for the next question, do you mind facing moral conundrums in your practice? Now, this of course, facing moral conundrums can very much affect your overall job satisfaction. And it's important to note that not everything is black and white, right? Some people are going to be significantly impacted uh, and others are going to feel everyone is justified to a defense, so to speak. But it's easier to talk about this again in examples, right? For example, in the tax arena, right? How would you feel about um, creating offshore funds? Uh, so investment that's outside of the scope of U.S. laws, or in project finance, how would you feel about working on a controversial um, oil and gas sort of pipeline that's going to affect the environment? In product liability, how do you feel about working on behalf of a pharmaceutical company that has a drug that had some uh, deadly outcomes? Or at the end of the day, in employment law, how would you feel about uh, defending a corporation where there were some sexual harassment claims? Um, against the company. Like I said, you know, you're going to encounter these throughout your legal career at some point. It really depends on how much you want this to impact your day to day. Um, and you can read the slide to see which one makes the most more sense for you. Um, but at the end of the day, we do learn that everyone is um, entitled to a defense of some sort. Yeah, you just have to decide whether you're comfortable representing them. <laughs> um, <laughs> The, the next question is, do you want to be an expert or do you want to be a generalist? And um, we actually like to kind of explain this more in the context of school. Sometimes that can you know, be a little bit easier because these practice areas, as we know, can get very overwhelming. Um, so, you know, recognizing as a 1L, you don't choose your classes, but even thinking back to college, are you someone, when those new courses come out, are you looking through that list and going, oh, you know, cool, I don't know anything about this area, that would be really interesting, I'm gonna take that class. Or are you the person who is, you know, more comfortable building upon knowledge that you already have and taking English literature one, two, three, four, and five? Um, this is the distinction we're trying to make with expert and generalist. And you can have that distinction in both the corporate like transactional practices as well as with litigation. So, you know, if you're a litigator who's a generalist, you are you're doing everything. It doesn't you you don't have that specialty. 
you know, the way someone who is a securities litigation um, associate or products liability, where you really become an expert in that area. The same distinction can be made on the corporate side, um, and we're going to get into this a little bit later with respect to geography. But in California, for example, most of the big law firms are going to structure their corporate practices where you're a generalist. And if your client is doing an M&A tra transaction, that's what you're doing. If they're doing finance, that's what you're doing. So you get a little taste of everything. And some people say that they kind of feel like in a way they're the outside general counsel. Um, New York is very, very different. And New York tends to be a much more specialized uh, experience. So you, the main buckets that you think of with respect to corporate would be M&A, finance, and capital markets, and maybe funds, although that's somewhat related, uh, somewhat different, I mean. Um, but under each of those big umbrella categories, you can get even more granular. It can be project finance, structured finance, um, aviation finance. So you have to think, do you want to be that expert or that generalist? And Again, both are great. They're just very different day-to-day -day experiences. Yeah, and one thing to add to this is this is really foundational, and I'm going to ask you to think 15 <laughs> years out or yeah. something like that. Are um, you overwhelmed yet? <laughs> yeah, it's really, really far into your career because it can be have a huge impact on your career path, whether you decide to be an expert or, or a generalist. An expert in a narrow practice, so uh, tax or trust in the states or, or ERISA, et cetera, as you continue to go on in your career, you typically are not going to be, you're going to be dependent on other practice areas to feed you clients, right? So you're not in a position where, you're in a position where your expertise is needed, but you don't necessarily need to build a book of business. However, a generalist, one who has to kind of deal with any everything and anything, they don't have a specialty. So they have to be in a place where they have to build a book of business. And guess what is the most important for making a partner in that space? Having that book. If you put it another way, if you think about your general practitioner doctors, right? You go to see your doctor when you have an earache, you go to see your doctor when you have, you know, a broken toe, you kind of go see your general practitioner for all of those things. But every once in a while, they're going to refer you to the ear specialist or the skin specialist or one, someone like that who depends on those referrals from the GP to, to build their own book. So again, think about the type of person you are. Are you someone who likely is going to have a lot of contacts in a lot of areas? Then generalist, uh, generalist practice might make sense. Are you someone who kind of just wants to put your nose down and do your work and not have to worry so much about having to build that book uh, later in your career, then it might make sense for you to develop your expertise early. Moving on to the next question, which is a little similar, is would you be attracted to a code-based practice? Basically, what we're asking you is, are you comfortable with gray areas or do you prefer a concrete answer to start with? The concrete answers are pretty easy. They're all regulatory or code-based um, uh, practices where you look at a statute or with some legislative intent and you know exactly where to go from there. No surprise that gray areas are where the big ticket sort of deals and matters and all that sort of stuff is. At the end of the day, as a lawyer, you're being hired for your intellect and how you interpret these gay, gray areas. Um, so it's important for you to just think about this a little bit um, because if you really, again, like that intellectual stimulation, then the gray areas might make sense for you. So question number six, are you comfortable with an adversarial practice? And this is actually a little more complicated and nuanced than you might think initially. Most people, when you ask them, you know, do you think litigation is adversarial? The obvious answer is yes. There's a winner, there's a loser, you're in court, you watch, you know, you're seeing these TV shows and movies. Um, and we're not saying that litigation is not adversarial, but we want you to really kind of separate the day to day versus the overarching process. So, what we mean by this litigation, you know, as I said, is the overarching process is adversarial. There's a winner and there's a loser. However, the actual day to day is fairly structured you have you know you know when your briefs are due when your um, motions need to be filed and when there is an issue there's a judge 
who makes a call and there's sanctions for bad behavior. So the day-to-day -day is actually relatively civil, um, not that you aren't representing your client zealously, but day-to-day um, -day it could be more civil. Corporate is actually the complete opposite. The mm -hmm. process, the overarching process is collaborative. You're trying to come to a happy medium and, you know, a former mentor once said, the best deal is the one where everybody thinks that they got a bad deal. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, but, you know, the overarching process is collaborative, but the day-to-day -day is not always, you know, wine and roses. It can get pretty contentious. So, um, this is another question where you really want to think, is this going to have an impact on you? And is it going to have an impact on your job satisfaction? Um, and you want to think about whether it's the overarching process or the day-to-day -day that would kind of impact your happiness. Yeah, oftentimes we'll work with associates um, who don't want to go to another firm because they had sat across the table on, from them on a corporate deal. And they're like, wow, they were such sharks on that deal and I don't know. But at the same time, they were representing their client and they're trying to, they are sort of, were hired to be that shark on that deal, right? So it's just something to just think about as you're, as you're trying to ascertain, like, do I have the personality where I can be a tough negotiator? Uh, corporate might make sense for you in that space then. Um, next up is the hot button issue here. How important, <laughs> how important is a predictable schedule? Now, bear in mind, what we are talking about here is your predictability as a mid-level and a senior and a partner, not necessarily as a junior associate. As a junior associate, you're being paid for your time. You are being paid to be available whenever the junior, or sorry, the senior associate or the partner is ready to give you their work. They're, they've gone through everything and you kind of wait around all day and, and get your work at the end of the day. But that's part of the apprenticeship model and um, at the end of the day, that's the training period for the first two years. But as you get more senior in your career, you will get a little bit more predictability on your hours. You'll still have to work uh, long hours, but at least you have a sense of what it is. So if predictability at that stage is important, then you might want to look at some of the more regulatory practices, 40 Act, um, or something related to ERISA or IP prosecution. Um, if it's not important, um, at the end of the day, you have bankruptcy, corporate, transactional litigation. You'll see this play out a little bit different later in the later in the presentation because some of those opportun uh, some of those practice areas in the not important side, at least when you don't have predictability in the law firm arena, will help you get predictability later in the uh, later on. We'll talk about that later, but it's just something to think about, at least in the law firm life these are the sort of categories that you want to focus on. And one other thing to add on the predictability front, um, most firms are going to require 2,000 hours. That's usually about the threshold. And I think the biggest thing that we hear from junior associates is they didn't fully appreciate what that means in practice because you think, you know, eight hours a day, okay, you know, that's pretty doable. But you don't necessarily bill every hour you're at work. Um, and that is, I think, a big adjustment to many people. So it just makes it that much more important to do something that you like. Um, and as Rue said, just to reiterate it, um, look at the people above you in, in terms of their predictability and manageability and not necessarily your experience as a junior, because that's hard to judge. Um, so the next question is, um, kind of what we previewed earlier. Where can your law degree take you outside of the law firm? And if, as you can see from this slide, lots of different places. Um, when we do this presentation in person, we always ask how many people in this room want think they want to make partner? And it's amazing. Every time it's like one or two hands. That's it. <laughs> um, and that is not a surprise to us at all, but it shouldn't come as a surprise because if you look at the structure of the law firm model, it's pyramid shaped. There's a lot of junior associates and very few partners. So where do people go? Um, you know, so there are different practice areas that are going to better position you for certain things depending on what your long-term goal might be. Um, overall, corporate in whatever practice areas, 
those areas tend to be the most well suited for in-house roles. Um, M&A tends to be the practice area where you see the broadest array of things. So if there has to be one corporate skill set that's most marketable for in-house opportunities, that tends to be it. But capital markets and finance as well. We see many associates go to clients or you know other opportunities through their own network or experience. I think the challenge becomes you know sometimes on the litigation side. We are not here to say that litigators can't go in-house. We are, obviously it goes without saying, making some vast generalizations here for purposes of helping you plan your career. Um, but it is true, it's more challenging for a litigator to get an in-house job. Um, usually where we see it, it's at a big company that has a lot of lawyers. That could be banks, insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies. Um, but more often we see a, litigators go to great government roles where they're getting, you know, oftentimes amazing trial experience. Um, they go to boutique firms, um, oftentimes, in, you know, kind of a newer area. We're seeing a lot more litigators go into compliance in various capacities. Um, so that's something to be thinking about. But the question we get all the time is, I know I want to go in-house. What practice area is going to help set me up for that? And, you know, from our perspective, the best practice area is always labor and employment. Um, it is something that every company in every industry, every size, every geography, there's always L&E issues. So there are a lot of opportunities for labor and employment associates to go in-house. Um, and, you know, again, there's a lot you can do outside of in-house opportunities non-business role, uh, uh, excuse me, non-legal roles, you know, or business hybrid roles, non-profits, um, you know, you name it, but it is important as you're thinking about what practice area you want to be positioning yourself really for your long term role. Yeah, and if you'll remember this uh, question number seven, you'll notice that all of the not so predictable law firm practice areas are the ones that are typically going to get you that predictability to go in-house. Oftentimes people say, I want to go in-house because I want that predictability. Well, guess what? You kind of have to put in your time not having that predictability and then it'll pay off dividends later in your career. So that's, that's why I previewed that earlier. Um, next question is, where do you want to live? Now, again, when we do this live, you know, we usually can ask people in the room, you know, where do you want to live following graduation? And everyone says, well, we're in New York, so everyone wants to live in New York usually. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> um, you, you typically can go. Um, they always have an idea of where they want to live, at least short term and long term. But if we ask them what practice area they want, they have no idea, right? Here's the thing. The city that you live in is going to service the types of clients that are there. This hasn't changed during COVID at all. So you want to think a little bit, what industries do you want to work in? Where do you want to go later in your career? And you also want to think a little bit about what's going to set yourself up and be, give you that flexibility to move around if you're not sure where you want to be. So keeping in mind, you know, in Boston, we see uh, a lot of work in the tech corridor, um, also in Silicon Valley. Right now, those practices, tech is very slow, right? So people are kind of twiddling their thumbs a little bit, waiting for things to come back. Um, in New York, of course, you see very a lot of ties to Wall Street, big corporations, et cetera. Um, down in Miami, there's a huge Latin American um, practice uh, influence. Um, in Houston, oil and gas. In LA, entertainment, um, lots of litigation there. DC, you're going to find a lot of government facing um, practice areas, whether that's regulatory or appellate, that sort of thing. People always ask us, though, where do I go? I'm not sure where I want to live. You know, um, where's the best place for me to start my career? There's no doubt that New York City, being the biggest legal market in the world, I believe, um, is the best place to start your career as a big law attorney. It opens up so many doors no matter what, even if you are in a specialized corporate practice area, whether that's investment funds or um, capital markets in New York, 
you can move to a general corporate practice in Miami or in California based on all, all the other factors that they're also looking at, which includes your grades, your school you went to, the type of firm you're at, et cetera. But it's very hard to go the other way around. <laughs> so if you really are unsure as to where you want to start your career, aim for New York City. It's expensive, I know, but it yeah. is, <laughs> it's a great place for you to start your career. Um, there's a high value placed on the sophistication of your matters. There's a high value uh, placed on sort of the types of type of work, working in sort of a fast, fast paced, hard, harder, tougher environment, whatever you want to say. Um, if you do that early on in your career, even as a third year, even as a fifth year, you know, you can write your ticket almost wherever you want to go. Oftentimes we work with our colleagues that cover Texas or cover um, California, uh, Northern and Southern California. And they say, well, we're happy to hire laterally to the extent that there's a good candidate. We prefer candidates coming from New York. DC is the same thing. They prefer candidates coming from New York. They just know that there's so many people here and it makes more sense for a candidate to want to leave the city and go come to their city. It, it makes more sense to them than someone who's just moving to another firm to change the wallpaper, so to speak. And that's our plug as arrogant New Yorkers. Kidding. <laughs> um, Fair enough. No, okay. The other thing to think about with respect to geography is when you want to make a move. And um, generally speaking, we advise people to move at the mid-level range where you have enough training under your belt to be valuable, but not senior enough to, you know, to be in a position where you don't have enough runway ahead of you for partnership. Mm -hmm. So obviously we're always happy to speak with people individually about their goals geographically, but um, it is important to just kind of be thinking about when you want to make a move, but we get it. Life gets in the way and things change, but um, you know, we're talking about it just from this uh, professional perspective. And one, one last thing to add on this um, that I forgot to mention is if you do want to go in house in a, in a place where there is a large local legal market. So for example, if you're in New York City and say, I wanna go in-house in LA, you probably are gonna have to move to a law firm in LA first, because the, again, there are local attorneys and there's a real preference for local attorneys in that space. We do see relocations happen often, but usually it's gonna be in Kalamazoo, Michigan, or somewhere where you don't have a really vibrant local legal market. And so that's where they're willing to bring people. But people are always surprised. They're like, what do you mean I have to move to a firm in Miami in order to get a job in-house in Miami? And I'm like, you don't have to do that. It just makes it much easier um, for you to do that. So that's another thing, that, another factor that you wanna think about as you map out your career. Bet you didn't realize you had to think 15 years out today. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, the last question is, how might current market conditions impact your practice group selection? And to be honest, we always hesitate about even including this question in a presentation because we are not here to you know, encourage anyone to run towards that bright, shiny object. We really, really want you to be honest and reflective and thoughtful in your process. That being said, you know, this is a business and you also care about your career development and you want to be in an area that is busy enough to support that career development. So this is not, this should be the last, the reason it's the last question is it should be your last factor um, to think about. But that being said, we did think it was important just to provide a bit of a snapshot of what we're seeing. The 2023 market is very uncertain right now. Um, there's a lot, um, the corporate deals, the corporate uh, practices rather, that were so, so busy throughout 2021 and 2022, at least the first half, have slowed. Um, the real question becomes when are they going to come back? And there are a lot of other people who are in a better position <laughs> than Rim and myself to be making predictions. But some areas that we are seeing a lot of activity in tend to be like, you know, the litigation and regulatory practices. Those have been very, very busy across all levels. Another area is cybersecurity, cybersecurity and data privacy. And this is interesting because a lot of the law firms don't have very highly developed practices in this area. So I think it's, it's ripe. 
it's a really ripe area for a lot of young attorneys to come in and really make an impact um, because it is something that's, you know, these issues are not going anywhere. And it's something that a lot of lawyers who are at firms don't have the expertise in. So that's something that we are seeing uh, pick up and hearing from our clients. The one area on the corporate side that we still have seen a pretty hot market is in the funds space. Um, that investment management space tends to still be pretty busy. But as we said, that can change on a dime at any time, as we saw last year. So um, with respect to industry, um, industries that just say financial services, apologies, um, financial services, healthcare, life sciences, and energy, those are the areas we're seeing, um, which are no surprise. And what we're not seeing as much currently is the tech uh, the tech work that was mm -hmm. so hot for so long. So um, again, not, you know, should not be the priority question, but it is something to at least have in the back of your mind. Great. So we've reached the end of our presentation. I just wanted to share a couple things for you to just think about. Remember, and I've previewed this all throughout, your career is a lifetime. You don't wanna think about year one, you don't wanna think about year three, you don't even necessarily wanna think about year five. What you're planning for is 10 years out, 15 years out, or even longer than that, right? But you have to really think about yourself and see what makes you tick so you make sure you make the right sort of decision so early on your career, because it's going to impact the rest of your life. So that's great. You, we've given you a lot of information. You have the law firm practice area practice summary guide that's going to give you even more in-depth information on, on each type of practice area that you might encounter. Um, but then where do you go from there, right? The best thing for you to do is to network and talk to practicing attorneys. And the great thing about being in law school is law school gives you so many opportunities to network. Here's the thing, networking is the most important tool in your arsenal and for every lawyer's arsenal. Everyone needs to know how to do it. I don't care if you're an introvert, I don't care if you're an extrovert, it's a really important piece of the puzzle. The law is a social profession, right? And it's really important for you to be able to talk with your colleagues, but also to people who are superior to you, um, find mentors, et cetera. And in law school, you have um, law firm receptions, you have affinity group receptions, you have um, New York Bar uh, Association or Bar Association receptions. Um, that you can go to and that you're invited to often. And everyone goes to those things because they want to network. So make sure that you take your time and be prepared with a few answers that you ask every attorney that you encounter, especially if you're targeting people in specific practice areas. You want to make it easy for that lawyer to network with you. You want to come prepared with a list of questions. You want to make sure if they give you any homework, you do that homework before you go see them. Lawyers, we love talking about ourselves. <laughs> so you just wanna make it easy for the lawyer to just show up and talk. But really, really, truly, as long as it doesn't affect your school schedule, really avail yourself on all of those networking opportunities because it will really help you throughout the rest of your career. Yes, and I was just gonna say, lawyers stop talking so that um, we can get to the Q&A. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> so just to just further iterate what, uh, what <laughs> yes so what Rue was talking about I'm going to try to go through this quickly we have a couple handouts in here we'll also send these to you during after the webinar so there's some information about a bar a state bar admission checklist um, a digest from Barbary and then this is a law practice summary that Rue was talking about that we spent a lot of time breaking down all the practice groups so you can um, click basically on the handout section of the console and they'll download or we will send them to you afterwards. So we're gonna go to Q&A right now. Um, we did get a bunch. So, um, excuse me, I went ahead there. My apologies. So let's start out with some Q&A for, ooh, where did my Q&A file go? Let's, oops, there we go. I got this stuff out of the wrong order here. So Rue, what are some practice areas? Um, wait a second, what are some? What practices are best if someone is likely to want to move states or geographies during their career? Oh, I think that's going to be the other one, the Steph. Sorry. Or yeah. Steph or Rue, whichever one that's you guys want to reply to. That's a really great question. So it, um, you want to look at 
the practice areas that are going to be most in, most in demand that are going to help you move around are things that are not necessarily tied to the state level. Um, so, for example, anything corporate, right? Because the corporate laws are typically federal in nature. That you'll see there will be, you know, state that state statutes that you have to comply to, but with the given how much you have to register and all that sort of stuff, you typically on the corporate side, you're gonna be able to move around with that uh, and including service service practice areas in corporate. So that whether that's IP licensing, tax, you know, that sort of thing, you definitely see a high demand in that space. Um, a federal litigator, so like at a high level, you're gonna see that as well um, in high demand. Um, one great way to try and make a move to another state is if you get a clerkship in that state or something like that, um, that would be helpful. But the local stuff is a bit harder, right? Um, it can it can be a bit harder, particularly if you're only doing New York specific law or et cetera. So it's just important to kind of look at the bigger practice areas. Steph, I don't know if you have anything. Yeah, to no, that's, that's exactly what I was going to say. Um, and that also um, doesn't take into account any bar exam issues um, mm -hmm. that, you know, there are some states where you can weigh in, some where you have to take the bar. So that might be an extra wrinkle and things too. One thing I wanted to add to that, though, and we didn't really discuss it on where do you want to live, but a lot of people will come to us and say they want to move internationally um, uh, at some point in their career. And you'd be surprised. It's really hard to move internationally with a general litigation background. Um, because if you think about it, that's specific to the U.S. courts and our system. Yeah. So, like, there isn't as, as high of a demand for litigators internationally as there are international arbitration, which makes a lot of sense. But also, um, on the corporate side, you'll see a big demand for capital markets because oftentimes all those international companies are registering under the U.S. capital markets laws. Um, or you'll see some sort of demand for project finance every once in a while or potentially m a depending dependent on the country so that's another thing that you want to consider if international is on your radar corporate might make more sense sense for you and just to be clear that goes both directions like mm -hmm. you know going from the u.s internationally or internationally to the u.s yep so we're talking about switching um states you know countries and whatnot what about practice areas like if i started out as xyz and i want to do pdq what about that I mean, I think that's the that's the challenge that we're trying to avoid. Um, where we see it happen is where you know where it's a little bit more of a pivot in the sense that there are some transferable skills. For example, if you're an M and A associate moving to finance, that's a little bit easier because at least you're kind of working on the same deal. It might be a different you know component, but you have that you know underlying transactional skill set as compared to you know a finance lawyer <coughs> excuse me a finance lawyer who's trying to become a litigator so where we've seen people have success is when it's not a complete 180 um again with rare exception um so that's why we you know just to bang everyone over the head that's why we really want you to think about that you know this process this selection early so even if it's you know kind of switching gears a little bit that's a lot easier because of that the investment that the firm has made in you from an early stage and because you have a lot of people coming behind you as mm -hmm. summers and first years and um, firms are not happy to start someone off as a first year even if you're willing to take a salary cut it's just there yeah and if you think about it, it makes sense because firms will have postings for lateral needs because they have a need. They lost a third year associate or they lost a fourth year associate that went in house or something like that. So when they have a posting for a for an M and A associate, for example, even if it's at the second year level, they need someone who has second year level experience. Every once in a while, we can get someone to be like, well, they've reviewed a lot of stock purchase agreements. And as you can see, they have the aptitude to sort of bring it up. So even though they're coming from a finance space, they feel like they'll have enough ramp up time. If the market's busy and hot, sure, that might happen. But you don't want to guess about what the market conditions are going to be. So that's why we want you to think about your practice area at this Again, that's a, hit the nail on the head. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that's also a really good point to bring up because, um, you know, I'm not sure how many students are really following the lateral market over the past few years, but 2021 was 
the most crazy year on the lateral mm -hmm. associate side. And that is where we did see a lot of people take advantage of that high demand opportunity to switch practice areas. And it did happen, but the market conditions need to support it. And you don't want to take that gamble that you're going to be looking to switch practice areas at a time where, you know, the market, you know, allows for it. Yep. I don't know if that answered okay. the question. But <laughs> So some quick questions with uh, some questions I think will have quick answers. Where does um, privacy and cybersecurity fall under those practice areas that you guys were talking about? I got two questions about that. In what? Uh, oh, uh, so with respect uh, to like corporate regulatory litigation? You yeah, mean? yeah, you got um, it. That's actually a really great question because it doesn't fit squarely into any of them. I would say it's actually more of a regulatory practice. Um, mm -hmm because you're not doing deal work and you're not doing litigation and there are a lot of, um, you know, kind of rules involved, but that's a, you know, it's a really, um, I'm glad that, you know, people kind of picked up on that, that it's, you know, th these are not perfect buckets, as you can yeah. see. We, we've seen it bifurcated a little bit. There's like, when there's a cybersecurity attack, right? Like where yeah. there literally is a, then that may lead to litigation, right? But oftentimes that there's, the regulatory stuff that one has to deal with. So usually you'll see someone, if they are in that space, they're doing a little bit of both, you know? Um, it's not very clear as to whether they're focused specifically on the regulatory side or the litigation side, or even some transactional work every once in a while. So because it's such a new area and the firms actually didn't have enough attorneys in this space, they had to hire people from in-house to bring them yeah. along. It's just growing and adapting. Um, but it, it continues to be uh, a big trend. Okay, well, you guys talked about um, something about, you know, if you start off in New York, you can easily move around and whatnot, and you, were say, you brought up about DC. So the question I have here is, does starting in DC have the same transfer transferability as New York? New York's obviously the top, but how, how, where does DC fall there? I think it kind of depends on the practice area, honestly. Um, you know, and just to be clear, we're not saying that that's the only, you know, New York's not the only place you can move from. It's just more that there's a higher volume of attorneys in New York. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's kind of the reason. Um, I think if you were in a transactional practice area, it's extremely marketable for mm -hmm. other uh, roles. If you're in more of a regulatory practice, some of those practices are really you know, DC focused antitrust is one, the one that's kind of jumping out to me right now. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the antitrust attorneys, partners and associates sit in DC. There's mm -hmm. some in New York, there might be a handful, you know, scattered across the country, but that's where, you know, the FTC, like there, when it, a lot of the regulatory practices are so tied to these government agencies, um, that skill set will probably be a little less marketable if you're going to, you know, Texas and Seattle. Right. Um, but this sort of addresses that um, that piece that I mentioned earlier about geographic flexibility after COVID. Um, this is really in flux. So the short answer is if you're at a firm that has an office, somewhere else, we see, uh, you know, let's say Seattle, for example, we do, we do see people make an internal move if they are moving, if they are still attached to an office. Mm -hmm. uh, it is harder and then we'll kind of work remotely with that team and travel as needed. That's a little bit easier than if there's no office at all. Um, it subjects firms to taxes i think we're probably getting a little um in the weeds here yeah <laughs> in the need. weeds yeah yeah one thing to think about though is remember there has there has been sort of what's been what we found is folks who end up having to work remotely early in their careers their training gets impacted a lot 
for, uh, firms are more more than willing to be flexible about it later in the career when the folks are mm -hmm. when attorneys are already trained. That's why 2021 and 2022 were such great years for mid level and senior associates because they knew what they were doing, and so we were able to kind of push the work through. But we saw that huge impact on the junior incoming classes. So the likelihood of you being able to do an intra office transfer um, is going to be dependent on your class year level and how willing it how okay it will be to work remotely um, with with the team because you'll probably still be tied to the DC office or whatever office right office. that's what I was trying to, you're still kind of tied to the office even though you're not there but we yeah. may have gone above the scope of this uh, <laughs> yeah and I'm gonna and I'm gonna and this was one last question um, just because we're at retirement I want to be you know not be called a liar for saying it going over an hour so um, you guys talked a lot about work-life balance and you know and everything with regard to big law. Do you see in-house and government roles have more work-life balance than law firms? The lawyer um, the answer is it depends. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I I I think the tr tricky part with in-house and government is you have more predictability, and that gives people the illusion of you know work-life balance i think um but i think that truly um if work-life balance is is what you're looking for um in in-house and government you're going to start in one of those busy thriving practices initially right that we talked about on that slide and then you might get to a place where okay let me evaluate what's going on in-house but you might go down market to a, to a firm that isn't in big law where the clients are less demanding where you have a better sense of your um better sense of your uh hours and predictability etc you're still going to be in a law firm but oftentimes people end up we have many people that make those kind of moves that go to a smaller firm after being in big law and one thing i want to really emphasize is it's always easier to go from big law to a mid-sized or smaller firm. It's very hard to go the other way around. So uh, it's another thing to really just think about as you're mapping out your career. Most lawyers will start in big law because it gives you the most options for later on in your life. I'm not sure. Okay, I'm gonna ask one last question. Oh, and I'm echoing too. Is there a place that somebody can go, a law school student, to find out what practice areas are hot in certain parts of the country without me saying to you, what's hot in Iowa or Texas or Chicago or Florida? Is there something that out people can go and look for online where they can see this? And I'll go on mute so I just stop that going. Um, I will just kind of keep up with the legal news and even just like, you know, the business news, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, you know, you name it. I think you can learn a lot about what's happening, but those the legal publications, I think would be a really great place to start. I'm not as confident that like the blogs are gonna um, mm -hmm. you know, really kind of get that information because they're not talking about which firms are representing which clients and you know who was on what deal or who was the lawyer on this case, who defended this client. It's a, um, some of those can be a little more gossipy. Uh, which is fine, which is fun, but not <laughs> um, helpful for that. So I would say a lot of different legal publications. Yeah, and I just want to emphasize what Steph said at the end of our our, our presentation. Um, what's hot in 2023 when you're a 1L may not be hot when you graduate in 2025. We've seen a huge difference between 2021 and 2023. So you really want to think about um, what's going to give you longevity and look at the his historically what's been busy in the areas um and then that would be a better gauge i think than necessarily um what's hot at the very moment right i i I've, I've worked with a lot of folks that went into antitrust thinking it was going to be super hot um and it was it wasn't as busy as it is now you know so it's really it's tricky you there's no crystal ball here stephanie and i have both been doing this for a really long time and every year it's it's something new, which is exciting for us, but it's not, there's no crystal ball at all. No. <laughs> okay, and just to, I'm gonna back up roll one slide here. So we have a portal that we're sharing with, that we use with Barbary, where we have a bunch of content. We're actually doing a bunch of videos this year on different practice areas. Rue just did one on litigation. So if you haven't signed up for the portal yet, scan the barcode, log in, 
Um, we will send you a quarterly newsletter. It's not really going to update you every time we add a piece of content. So don't worry. We're not going to spam the heck out of you. But um, we put information in there. Um, you know, it, it, it's great content for you to use for it's basically about what your life was going to be like as a lawyer, as well as some tips to help you, you know, get get your role. So um, I'm going to end because we are out of time. Um, the next one we're going to do webinar is going to be in June. We did OCI, OCI prep last year. We're going to do it again on June 14th. If you're not, you can scan this now and sign up. If not, don't worry. I'll send this out to you as all after as well. And again, thank you both. Thanks for doing this with me. Rue, this is two years in a row. Stephanie did OCI prep last year. If you saw that, you might recognize her, her mugshot from that. Rue has done this twice now. Are we going to do this in 2024? So um, thank you all very, very much. I appreciate it. Um, Rue, go celebrate your holiday. Stephanie, go celebrate Women's uh, International Women's Day. We both will. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. Me too. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. We really appreciate your time. We know how busy you are with school. So thank you, and we'll talk thank to you. you soon. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.